Hi Guy, welcome to the second episode of the Amiga Armor podcast. Uh, before we uh, jump right into it, I thought we'd have a look at uh, more recent news. Now, obviously with the Amiga being such an old system, we don't really get very many uh, new bits of hardware, new games, stuff like that. So as and when I find out about this stuff, it won't always be uh, 100% on the ball because I'm just one person. Uh, I will report back on the podcast, have a bit of a chat about it and see what's happened in the world of the Amiga. But uh, a couple of things that really caught my eye uh, recently was uh, a title known as Wasted Dreams, which was, uh, I believe, was originally a Amiga CD game, which had, uh, it's like an isometric uh, action game adventure where you're like watching your chat walk around, interacting with the world, you know, shooting at stuff, having the adventure. But the, the, the difference about this one is that the entire game is fully voiced, but the incredible part is it's voiced by one person, and the voice is is for the nineties a typical terrible, over the top, uh, pretty dead planet type. It's a rather rather poor version of what you would expect for someone doing the voice on a game, but it's worth listening to for for that alone. Anyway, uh, uh, somebody over on the EAB, which is the English Amiga board, has managed to convert it into a, a, a hard drive uh, edition. Uh, and that's also available, as, a, as I'm looking at it now, a WHD load edition. So it can be fully installed and played as if you know it was a full-on original game. I will stick a link into the... Uh, uh, episode uh, notes uh, I do actually have a, a website now for the podcast it's just amigarama.com every episode as we pick stuff out I will post links up there so have a look at each episode I mean as well as listening to this on iTunes and, and the typical places you'll be able to play it back because I'll, I'll upload each episode onto the actual website so uh, it'll all work very nicely so yeah that was uh, Wasted Dreams as a first one the next bit of news uh, uh, was a, a, a title called Crazy Priest. Now, when I first saw this one, I wasn't sure what to make of it because it, it, it looks very, very similar to Gauntlet with a, a, at the same time, that sort of graphical look that you get with the likes of, like, say, Bomberman. And you're running around, you're collecting jewels, shooting at enemies and stuff like that. And it's, it's like a weird little action puzzler. But, I mean, I was having a quick go at it and... and I was having to play this one through an emulator because it needs a beast, an absolute beast of uh, an Amiga to play compared to what I've got. I think it's about, I'm looking at the minimum requirements, oh, at least two megs of RAM and a, uh, oh, sorry, no, it's got to be an Amiga Classic with a 68020 processor. I don't think that'll work with a 500. Uh, so I did play it on an emulator. I had a, a bit of a blast with it. I mean, the, the couple of guys have worked on this for over two years. Uh, just recently completed it. It's available now. I will stick a link into the show notes. Uh, if you want to just wander over there, the, the website is called gryretro.com. And then there's a section in there called New Amiga Games. Worth a download. I think there's about 16 to 17 levels to play through. And it has two player games on it as well. You know, it's a brand new title. It's a new Amiga game. Go support it. Now, for this week's episode, I wanted to pick a game that appealed to me personally. You know, something that really got my interest going back in the day when I had a, a classic Amiga and everything. And one of the first titles that always comes to mind uh, is one of the first demo discs, if you like, which I was really obsessed with. You know, I needed to... This is back when I... I if I wanted the latest and greatest, it wasn't always easy to get. Even with my ability to get copy games, I couldn't get 100% of everything. And Jet Strike was always up there. I think it was Amiga Action or possibly Amiga Power, one of the big mags with a, a free demo disc on the front. And it was on, like, a few flying missions... Uh, and best, it, it hooked me straight away because I could see there was a really, really promising game. And as a, I don't know what you really call it. It's like it's like an action, dogfighting, tactical warfare style game. There was nothing really quite like it. I mean, looks wise titles at the time probably the closest thing it looked to was uh, was and this is in by no means a, a gameplay comparison but uh, uh, Top Gun on the NES which is a truly terrible game but that side on view of, of taking off and flying and you know being able to spin and loop the loop and have, have combat and stuff and it, it was that sort of a game but 
uh, for an Amiga title, it, 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 it was always one of my favourites, always something I went back to. I mean, just having a quick look at the story, I've got a few lines of it just scribbled down here in the notes, but it starts... The last you heard from 009 was just after he had an, had infiltrated a meeting of SPUD, which stands for Society of Particularly Undesirable Dastardly Dudes, which is a secret organisation made up of arms dealers, mad dictators, psychopaths and traffic wardens. You know, straight away there, it's, this is the, what the humour's like throughout the entire game. The coded message that 009 sent went along the lines of Spud, planning to take over the entire world. Let's do lunch. Cheers, 009. Unfortunately, when you arrived at Shea Bond, oh God, for your lunch and secret agents meeting, you found 009 slumped over the menu with a knife in his back. To cap it all, the steak was undercooked. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah, very silly bit of humour there, but the rest of the story, pretty much, it, it, it's all gibbers. <laughs> it's, it, it's ridiculous, and it, it's all along them lines, and the missions tie into that sort of a humour. Now, the game itself, uh, I think it was it was published by Rasputin, and that would have been in uh, oh 1994, but it was developed by Shadow Software. Now, looking into them as a company, I mean, it, it was just a name for a couple of guys, really, a couple of brothers, chaps called Aaron and Adam Fothergill. I think I pronounced that right. And, uh, yeah, you know, they got together. They were big play nuts at the time. Uh, they, they really wanted to do like a side on combat game i think they'd have similar things practicing coding from before and this was their first attempt at like a commercial product i believe and i think it worked out really really well i mean for what they came up with i mean just looking at my notes you know this was both voted the 28th best game of all time on the c the, for the cd32 version which was in 1996 now there was a a version for every single Amiga. So, you know, like 5 and 600, uh, uh, which come with, I think it was about 40 planes included on a couple of discs. Whereas the uh, A1200 and the, the, the CD32 editions, look, they had 60 planes each. So there was a bit of a difference. And you might think, well, it's only like 40 to 60 planes. It doesn't sound like a lot. But when you start looking into like what these guys had done, they had actually gone through every every single plane and like hand drawn uh, uh, sprite art for all like the loops and the combat and and every single movement throughout the world and they've even commented in various interviews about just uh, the amount of time and effort and just how far they had to go just to get that that much level of detail in the game i mean uh, at the time this uh, one of the things that always stood out to me because i, I I used to get like one of these uh, magazines where you'd pay about, I think it was uh, a couple of pound a week and it'd be like a cover a set subject and there'd be something attached to the cover. Like maybe after a while you'd be like building a dinosaur or a toy plane or a car or something and all that air affix tile super gluing models together and you know, hanging them off the roof. Yes, I did do some of that to Sunday. I was quite sad. It's not, it's not, <laughs> it's, uh, it's not something I've actually got the skill to do anymore. I'm, I'm afraid it's, it's all a, a long time ago, but. You know, this is back during the days of, of you know, the mid nineties and stuff and, and, and all that glorified war stuff that was going on and all over the top. And, and I think this is a time of like the, the stealth fighter and one of the, I mean, one of the great things about this as a game is just the amount of vehicles that they cover. You've got pretty much, you've got everything from like uh, World War Two planes going go back decades, hang gliders, uh, F-15, which was, I think, one of the main combat, you know, it was like the most modern advantage plane at the time. Uh, I think, but I'm trying to think back now, I think there was a MiG-29, uh, uh, the Stealth Fighter, as I said before, <clears throat> a couple of helicopters, uh, I'm trying. There was even there was oh, that was it. One of them. There was even a dragon in there, which you you could actually like go swooping through the sky, blowing fire at enemies and stuff like. That. It, it was very very inventive for. Uh, uh, it sounds like the limited, but when you actually play the game, there's an incredible a no, number of vehicles. 
to use it, it, it works in a funny way as well because like every single mission you can do you can select uh, uh, like a, a plane to do but you're only given a set amount for a full playthrough of the game so if you wanted to on the first mission you, you could select the most like souped up amazing plane possible and you'll have like three or four of them available throughout the entire game so if you use them in the first couple of missions acting like an idiot even though you might need them later on in the game once the gone they're gone you know once you've blown them up you've wrecked them you're out of luck you're completely out of luck so it has a very interesting way it's it's sort of like inventory management of 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 building the game um yeah so i i mean going back to it as a game the whole it sounds very action orientated the fact that it's into dog fighting and and you know circling planes and recon style missions and dropping people off and taking uh, 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 pictures of sites and, and, and other airplanes you know spying that sort of things but it's it for what it is and and, and the level of control that you've got it's actually quite complex and complicated i mean it used similar sort of controls you know like like pressing down swoops the plane up and, and then up you, you, you know you can mess around as well with the keys if you don't like that sort of thing but back in the day i used to play this with um an actual joystick and i found it too difficult at the time i really just could not get on with it and at the moment, you know, because I've got a, a new system, I, I actually picked up ages ago. This is but uh, uh, like an adapter which converts. Uh, uh, I got like a PS2 controller which I can use with any like eight or sixteen bit nine pin joystick adapter. It's a really really nifty adapter. I've had this thing for years. I think I think you can still buy them on eBay to this day, but well worth picking up. I mean, the PS2 controller is just one of my favourites, but the the great thing about that is being able to go back to Amiga and I can use the stick. I can use like the the, the D pad sort of thing, and, and you can use that across different games, and you can even program buttons. I think as well. I, I might be wrong a bit on that. My, my memory is a bit hazy, but the the Amiga is only a one button system, uh, a, a, a one fire button system anyway, so it doesn't really matter. But using that controller on this game just game just gives you such an extra level of control it's really hard to describe i mean it's quite difficult i mean i i I used to play it religiously on the keyboard back in the day because it was the only way i could get the exact amount of up and down to move through stuff and swoop and so i mean joysticks were just too difficult but just spending five minutes with it straight away and the pad is so comfortable it really does add like like an, an extra level to it now, uh, there's a few other things. I just, just had a look up some Easter eggs for the game as well. One which uh, made me quite, quite laugh, which I read in an interview. But apparently there is actually uh, an Easter egg hidden in the game, which is a, a, a UFO. Now, apparently there's only a, a one in a million chance of this ever appearing across any game, any person playing the game. But it did actually get reported on. I think it was Amiga Power. Uh, but basically all, what happens is that a UFO will come down and crash into you. And then to apologize, it gives you up a souped up super plane, which is like one of the best planes in the game. And it's really, really amazing. But the thing is, this is almost impossible to get. And, and they just threw it in as a joke. And they even said that, you know, the, the idea behind it is that maybe one person might find it be a neat little trick for someone out there. And they were a, a, a surprise at just how quickly someone eventually found it. I mean, I can't say I've got it, but it might be something to go and uh, look on YouTube. Uh, now, there is various versions of the game. I said, like, no, there's the, the 500, the 1200, the CD32. Now, the CD32 is probably the, the best version by far. I mean, in particular, it does, because it's CD and it's got uh, music on it. Uh, they've done, like, a, a joke rendition of uh, Top Gun's Danger Zone theme. I'm sure I'm not, I'm not humming or singing that into the mic. I'm sure you all know it, but they, they did a, a joke song called, uh, Fast Jet Fever. And it's worth just tracking down, down on YouTube and just having a listen because it's really entertaining. It's actually quite funny and it just takes the Mickey out of that song and so on. But, you know, it, it's for the time, I suppose. It, it was just the mid nineties and, and, and this sort of humor was quite prevalent in a lot of games and, and it just added to the atmosphere of the title. It, it, it was a, a real joy to play. 
Now, one of the uh, great things about this, when I'm playing the uh, A500 version, uh, it's only on two discs. And even though I'm running it off the GoTek, the thing is the GoTek load speed is, it just runs as if it's a normal floppy disk drive. It's not super fast or, or even though it's running off a USB stick, it doesn't mean you're actually getting like USB type speeds. Uh, but even with two discs, uh, uh, and you know, you have to flip between the two. The load times were incredibly short. There's, there's, you're not sat there for like five, ten minutes waiting for it to go on between games. You don't have lots and lots of disc swaps or anything like that, which was, uh, quite impressed me, especially with some of the missions and so on. And it doesn't have you swapping the discs constantly, but, uh, which is always a, a big plus. But, um, I mean, as you can probably tell already, as a game, I absolutely love this. I, 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 it was a joy to play when I was a kid. I was absolutely addicted to it. it, it the, the timing of it was just right. And I think it holds up incredibly well today. It's still worth going back to that, that sense of, that British sense of humor is still there. It's, it's a good laugh. It's funny. You've got so many things to play with, so many different types of missions. Um, I say just just some of the simple stuff like, like just being able to eject from the plane, which is is a great laugh because you can be flying over something. You've run out of weapons like bombs and machine guns. You aim your plane at something and you just do like a kamikaze mission and just eject out of the top and then crash your plane in. Yes, you'll lose a life or something, but you know at the same time you can have success on the mission. And add to this as well, it ties in is some missions can only be completed if you do like really really difficult things like flying between between balloons, collecting someone, saving someone, but then you've got to fly all the way back, um, avoiding enemy fire and stuff, and then you've got to land the plane, but it works really, really well. The controls are great. It's very... It, can be quite difficult to like land and control the plane delicately enough, but once you've got it, there is a a level of skill to it. I mean, the, the whole game has this... It's very... It's a very good but difficult learning curve... When you start off on the first few missions, they're quite easy. You know, there's not much to them. It's just to get you used to controls and just see how it goes. And, you know, it really does ease you in for about four or five missions. And then the difficulty really starts to ramp up. And by about the, the fifth or sixth mission after this point, it gets extremely difficult. And practically the only way you're going to get past it at this point is if you practice and play it properly. You you really need to put some effort in and have some proper skill on and I'm not saying that to put people off because it people be think, oh, it's just too difficult. No, you just need to have a bit of skill at the game. You need, you need to be able to play it properly to get past that point. And, and the great thing is once you've achieved it, you don't lose that skill. You've still got it. And then you take it on to the next missions and the missions get more complicated and more complex and more difficult. And it all just, it's a rather neat package and it just the way it, it eases you into that and then ups it. It's a nice curve to it and it always impressed me. I mean, you, again, it was a really fun game. I, I was really hooked on it back in the day. Probably one of my favorite parts about it was the whole, the dog fighting aspect, because just being able to go and like lock your weapons onto the other enemies, being able to loop the loop and chase after them. You could go in like anything from modern day planes to, uh, well, they're not, mo- that's it, they're 20 years old now. They were modern at the time. Uh, but you know, you have all these really neat planes to play from like World War II type planes to modern day. And then uh, you could go out there and do proper fighting combat. And you would have to plan your missions and really put some effort into it. And there was some, uh, well, some really fantastic stuff just uh, shoved in there. I mean, it's not perfect by all means. Probably at the time, it's probably about an 80, 85% type of review. I would put it a bit higher than that because I had a lot, I still do get a lot of fun out of it because it's, whenever I get an Amiga or whatever system it is, I always play a copy of this first. I just ca- I cannot help it. But it does have its fault. I mean, the first thing I had with it, and because, uh, you know, I've not played it in years and when I loaded it up to just, start having a go again and get make me familiarize myself with how it all plays the main menu is is terrible i think it's probably the, the time you know there wasn't really the people that like, like the whole human interface stuff to do with games and programs wasn't really all that good back then you know they didn't really develop stuff like people weren't like, like paving the way or doing certain things the way they should be done so it was all very yeah, uh, it's all just higgledy piggledy and thrown in there. What a terrible word, but the 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 main menu system is really really complicated. 
I mean, when you when you go to it, you've got lots and lots and lots of different buttons, and you've got different training mission buttons. So you've got things like like the recon, the camera, uh, night mode, bombing mode. Uh, you know, spy drop, and then there's something called like, oh, there's a practice mode, which is self-explanatory. Then you've got like a Aero Olympics, which uh, I think that's it. You, 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 I think it's nine or ten missions, which are all on a timer based. And you've got to, it's like, it's like multiplayer, but it can be against a computer, but you, you, you have to outscore, score. Sorry, no, it isn't against a computer, and you have to outscore your opponent and the highest score wins. Uh, it's, it's a nice, neat, extra little feature, but, one thing that really annoyed me when you go to it, when you, when you go to the, uh, to like start the main, the main button, in order to, sorry, the, the start of the main game, you would think, well, there must be something there like mission begin or mission start. There isn't. There's just a button called combat. And you, and looking at it in the mix of all these like training modes and different modes, and it's not like, it's just slap bang in there. And you just look at it and you just think, well, it must just be like a fighting mode. But no, it isn't. If you click that, it starts the main game and you get all the missions one after the other. And it's a very odd choice. And I don't know why they didn't break that down a bit more or make it more simplified and something like that. It just really doesn't do the game well or, or do it any favours. But anyway, you know, that's probably the, that for, to say that's a problem compared to the rest of the game. That's, that's a very, very <laughs> little issue. I mean, as it goes on, it does get incredibly difficult towards the end. But the great thing is if you mess up, you, you have messed up. It's very, very rarely the game's fault. It, it's all down to your own skill level and the amount of time and effort you put into it. But it's certainly worth going back to, guys. I mean, if you can get a copy of this, it's, it'll work on any Amiga. I mean, I would highly, highly recommend that you do because it's very addictive. There's a hell of a lot of contact in there, but content in there. But if you can, I would say go for the A1200 or the CT, CD32 edition. Now, I don't have an A1200. That's still on my uh, wish list, and, and I'm determined I'm going to get one eventually. I'm, I'm going to start saving up, I promise. Uh, I, I, I'll, I'll need it because I want to cover the AGA titles eventually to, uh, for the podcast. But just the fact that you know, one of my all-time favourite games has also got uh, an extra version uh, um, on the A12. It just, you know, it's just perfect. You couldn't ask for more. So yeah, highly recommended. Uh, it was, that was just a bit of a brief look. I think I hope I'm not bored you too much there. Uh, this is what the episode is going to be like each week. Uh, I'm going to, you know, I'll go into a game in depth go back over it, maybe talk about it from my own perspective, of course, and a bit of my history where possible, uh, even if it's a bit of a review or go into the history of the game. Uh, and I'm I'm going to try and pick the games and, and, and to have something to actually talk about, to discuss around, not just say, oh, this is game A, it's good, it's bad, these are its, you know, I, I don't want to go into it like that. We want to have something, we can have a bit of a discussion around now if if you like this by all means please review it or give it five stars or, or i know it's only, it's only the second episode but please don't but don't give it one star <laughs> on itunes it really will help because especially as i'm trying to just get started with these uh, uh, uh amiga episodes uh, and the more people that see it the the more reason it'll give for me to uh, keep pushing on and doing more now by all means please come to the uh, amigarama.com website uh, it's only just beginning, but I will start putting up more and more content and I'm hoping to uh, grow that over time. Uh, there is a Facebook page. Just search uh, Amiga Armor on Facebook. It should pop up. I will, of course, respond to comments. But one thing I would start I like to ask people to do is maybe start recommending some games. Something you think you would like me to cover or even if you just want to ask questions about games you have good experience with or you think will make a good episode to go into. And uh, yeah, I mean, maybe I'll build a list and we'll, we'll take it from there. Uh, as always, guys, uh, thanks for listening and uh, please look out for uh, more episodes uh, in future. 